Why, why do you think that there seems seems to be or appears to be a push in government now for this to come out, whereas previously it was a um, a subject that people were sort of ridiculed, whereas now it's a serious subject that the White House are talking about and the news agencies are talking about, whereas previously it would be a joke piece of X-Files music. It's very serious now. What what do you think's changed? Well, it could be one of two scenarios. First, they know that there could be a mass sighting and they've got to have an answer for it. It's the same, it's the same if you're dealing with the Vatican uh, because they're, they're very involved in this also because they set up Father Funes in 2009 to talk about you know our alien brothers and sisters. <laughs> if they're going to do that, I mean, why would they do that? If they're going to do that, then they know something's going to come down and they have to be ready for it. So maybe they know something is going to happen, some kind of intervention, and they can't say, oh, no, we had no idea. They say we knew all along. So that could be one scenario. This Dr. Stephen Greer scenario, and I was in his film, the, uh, I think it was called The, the Cosmic Hoax. Um, I, the scenario in that film says, look, we have run out of enemies. To, so now what we, in order to get money for, um, uh, you know, for defense, our defense, not everybody else's, but our defense, we have to create another enemy. And that is what um, uh, Dr. Werner von Braun told Carol Rosen, Carol Rosen's in the movie. And she says the last card is the alien invasion card. Well, that's so stupid. I, I you know, I mean, we could pretend like Marco Rubio says a matter of national security. They haven't done anything yet. So like what? All of a sudden, one day they're going to come down and do an alien invasion and we have to get the money from Congress to shoot at them. It, it, some of this does not make any sense. The following is my conversation with Paula Harris. Paula is a fascinating lady with real world experience researching, interviewing and even experiencing the UFO phenomenon. Paula's written a number of incredibly rare research books, uh, such as Trinity, where she teamed up with Jacques Villet, Conversations with Colonel Corso, a personal memoir and photo album, and her latest book, Connecting the Dots, Making Sense of the UFO Phenomenon. Paula's been referred to as the Barbara Walters of ufology, a fascinating lady who has taken me down a number of rabbit holes since our conversation. Her brain is an encyclopedia of ufology. So, the following is my conversation with Paula Harris. Thanks very much for joining me, Paula. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Um, I've been doing lots of research into you prior to this interview and your your um, your history and your research and what you've been involved in in the past. I mean, you go back many, many, many years. It's fascinating stuff. Um, fascinating. I, I wonder if you're able to just just provide just to the, um, the people listening in your kind of background and, and, and kind of where it got started. Yes, uh, actually, I've been around for a long time uh, uh, because I started working with Dr. J. Allen Hynek. I mean, he's the godfather of ufology. Uh, people know that. And and I began when I saw the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and that was in 1980. So never in a million years did I ever think I would work with Dr. I, uh, J. Allen Hynek, who's an astronomer. And, uh, you know, wrap up my career with uh, Jacques Vallée, because, uh, you know, you're probably aware that Jacques Vallée and I wrote a best-selling book called Trinity, and it's just, Trinity is out, it's, everybody's read it, it's the first UFO crash in 1945, one month after the atomic bomb. We're lucky, because Trinity was just translated, it's in four languages, but it was just translated into Japanese. So um, I never thought, because I, I really think that, you know, that my whole career has been guided. It wasn't something that I wanted to do necessarily. I have a master's in education and have taught high school English for 45 years. So when I went to see Heineck in Illinois um, and he said, I heard you were born in Italy and you could work with me translating all the Italian sightings. 
I realized that I was working with an astronomer. So what I started doing was just going with him and he'd come to Colorado and we we would do research together. So I learned good research. I learned it was real. And by the way, he called it UFOs and I'm calling it that. We don't need to change the name. The government knew, uh, if, if, if we have Project Blue Book it, it, with Alan Hynek, then the Air Force, this is the Air Force, knew that this was real way back when Hynek was working on it. So all of the stuff that comes out of Washington sounds brand new, but are, are you kidding me? If, if you have Project Blue Book and you have uh, all the other projects, I worked with Clifford Stone in Crash Retrieval, I mean, he was my good friend until he died. He did 12 crash retrievals and they have Project Moon Dust and Blue Fly. Then, then they know what they got. They know what they were doing. And the problem is, and I'm going to share this with you, is that we've got three branches of governments and they don't talk, I mean, of, of military. The Navy, who's really in charge of UFOs. We have the Navy, we have the Army, and we have the Air Force. So they don't talk to each other. And the reason why they don't get together is because the whole entire UAP, UFO thing is about government contracts, is about outsourcing the technology. And I only found that out, and I'm doing all these commercials, because I was the journalist that was the closest to Colonel Philip Corso. And this is my book, Conversations with Colonel Corso. When Colonel Corso came out and he was an army, uh, and talked about his involvement with the uh, artifacts of Roswell. He wasn't at Roswell, but he got the artifacts in the 1960s. He told me about the back engineering and about working in the Pentagon under Robert Kennedy. And also he told me personally that they, the army had been back engineering certain things. So you can understand I was putting together, I was putting together all the dots. I was connecting the puzzle and, and that's how I figured out a lot of this stuff. There's so many areas that we could dive into there. I just want to sort of um, sort of rewind slightly and, and just jump into, you, you mentioned about the UFO UAP thing. And it's, it's fascinating because a, a few people I've spoken to are just absolutely against um, the, the, the use of UAP. Can I just ask, what do you think, why, what do you think the motivation was for, for the government to change change the terminology? Well, for you not to go and do your homework and go backwards, like I just did to the to Blue Book and Project uh, and 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 Grudge Project and 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 the our Robertson panel it was all this for you not to go back and do your homework. They're rebranding it as something new, and when you rebrand it as UAP, then you think it just happened yesterday. And and no, how could it happen yesterday? Uh, our book Trinity tells you that the first crash was one month after the atomic bomb, and it was it was exactly 13 miles away from ground zero. So they knew then. I mean, they knew then. Then then we have Roswell, 1947. We have Kenneth Arnold. We have a history of all of this. But the average person, and this is really sad, doesn't read, or they don't stutter, study it like scholarly study. They, it's entertainment. It's fun. It's like, they tell me about UFOs. It's fun. And that's not what it should be. In order for it to be studied, you need to have a university involved. You need all three branches of the military involved to share their secrets. And you need people who go back to the source for their information. So the rebranding of it distracts you. And uh, in general, in general, when the new whistleblowers, and I'm sure you're watching this because you're very young, <laughs> so I'm sure you're watching this when, when the new whistleblowers come out, you don't look at the old whistleblowers that risk their lives to tell the truth. So then it looks like a brand new thing that just came out in the New York Times that makes it legitimate. And for me, uh, that's been around for a long time and known, you know, astronaut Edgar Mitchell. I was I was very close to the former defense minister of Canada, Paul Hellier, uh, Colonel Corso. I mean, so many people involved that were heroes. For me, it's frustrating because I feel like saying, yeah, then the guy that came out last week, why don't you go back to the, the, the original whistleblowers, not the guy that's sitting there in front of Congress that says we have bodies and we have 
witchcraft will die? Of course we do. And we and we've always had them. But people that are don't do it's like people that don't do the homework or don't do the due diligence to go back and look at at uh, the history of disclosure. And, and, and a lot of us have been at it for a long time, including Jacques Vallée, uh, Alan Hynek, Jacques Vallée, uh, uh, Nick Pope. I mean, a lot of people have been here before the, these guys in Congress came out. And, and uh, there's been a lot of heroes and a lot of people who risked their lives at Disclosure Project Dr. Stephen Gurm and all, all those people in 2000, the air traffic controllers, the 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 uh, pilots from Latin America that have problems with UFOs, that's all ignored. It's like it didn't happen. It's like some new thing. It just happened because a couple of guys came in front of Congress. So people like me, Paula Harris, are frustrated because uh, and and people what we call the old timers are kind of frustrated because we piece together a lot of this and, and and it's just one mass confusion now one of my very first videos um on this uh, this account was uh, paul hellier and i think i mean it's, it was an old clip and i sort of cut a few pieces together and lots of people were sort of shocked and amazed by this it's, this is really old footage you know this goes back very very far but I think it kind of it talks to the, the 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 mindset of perhaps younger people today that want very small bite sized pieces of information, and going out and reading a book. Um, oh. Very short attention spans, <laughs> unfortunately. Can I tell you the background of that? Because that was two thousand and five. All right, and, and I was in Italy. I was working in Italy from nineteen ninety four to two two thousand and seven, and. I knew Paul Hellyer was going to come out and, and say something uh, at the University of Toronto. I knew he was going to be there. And I was supposed to be there, but I was really sick. Uh, I was in the hospital. I couldn't attend. Um, but 2005 is when he said, and this, this is a former defense minister of Canada, UFOs are as real as the airplanes over our head. So Paula, that's the one of the only field researchers, jumps on a plane at my own expense, goes to Canada, and I get an interview with him, and it's on my YouTube channel, and you're welcome to look at it. And and I said, well, you know, I couldn't attend the uh, you know the, the original uh, where you spoke, but could you do an interview for me? And what he said is very interesting because he said, I read. Colonel Corso's book, The Day After Roswell, and I called several generals. Well, of course, he's Minister of Defense. Well, he was Minister of Defense when we, uh, when McNamara was Minister of Defense for Kennedy, uh, so that we're dealing with the 60s. He said, I called several generals, and they said it was true and more. And I said, Paul, my God, you know. He said, so this is true. He said, so I'm going to do my own research. He said, because... If, because it's not so much that the UFOs are here, it's that we haven't thrown away the technology. It's that we have technology. And Paul, God bless him, he died like three years ago, um, said to me that technology could save the world. It could save it from starving. We wouldn't have the petrodollar. We would have an easier life. We would be able to help people. So like Stephen Greer and, and, and Dr. Stephen Greer and Paul were thinking along the same lines, it's not just to tell the truth, it's to share the technological advantages with the common people. Uh, because the, whatever is secret about that technology was a gift to the planet. And it wasn't just a gift to the military industrial complex, it was a gift to the people of Earth. <laughs> And so when you hear Dr. Greer say, well, you've been robbed. He's got a new movie that I think it's called The Hidden Secret for like 50 years. You've been robbed 50 years of, of a modern technology that would clean up global warming, uh, help starvation, um, it, you know, and all this. You've been robbed of that because that went deep black. So you see, when I start talking how very complex the UAP, UFO disclosure is you see how very very complex it is yeah 
why do you think that there seems to, seems to be or appears to be a push in government now for this to come out, whereas previously it was a um, a subject that people were sort of ridiculed, whereas now it's a serious subject that the White House are talking about and the news agencies are talking about, whereas previously it would be a joke piece of X Files music. It's very serious now. What what do you think's changed? Well, it could be one of two scenarios. First, they know that there could be a mass sighting and they've got to have an answer for it. It's the same, it's the same if you're dealing with the Vatican uh, because they're, they're very involved in this also because they set up Father Funes in 2009 to talk about you know our alien brothers and sisters. <laughs> if they're going to do that, I mean, why would they do that? If they're going to do that, then they know something's going to come down and they have to be ready for it. So maybe they know something is going to happen, some kind of intervention, and they can't say, oh, no, we had no idea. They say we knew all along. So that could be one scenario. This Dr. Stephen Greer scenario, and I was in his film, the, uh, I think it was called The, the Cosmic Hoax. Um, I, the scenario in that film says, look, we have run out of enemies to so now what we in order to get money for um uh you know for defense our defense not everybody else's but our defense we have to create another enemy and that is what um uh dr Werner von braun told carol rosin carol rosin's in the movie and she says the last card is the alien invasion card well that's so stupid i i you know, I mean, we could pretend like Marco Rubio says it's a matter of national security. They haven't done anything yet. So like what? All of a sudden, one day they're going to come down and do an alien invasion and we have to get the money from Congress to shoot at them. It, it, some of this does not make any sense. So down deep in my heart, I think it's getting ready for a scenario, but I don't know what it is. I can't tell you what it is. It could be that uh, there could be some manifestation um, because they have shut down our nu nukes and they have been involved in, in you know, not having us destroy ourselves up until now. There could be some manifestation and then the government then comes out and says, we already always knew, so this is no secret. But is any more than that, any more disclosure than that, I personally don't believe you're going to get. So that probably comes on to the next question then regarding sort of the NDAA and the UAP Disclosure Act. Do you think much will come of that? Or do you think we're, I mean, this is, you know, 70, 80 well, years. Like what can come of that? It's, you know, they're real. And like Paul Hallier said in 2005, there's, he is the former defense minister saying, they're as real as they're put. I mean, what else do you want? I mean, they're real. If you're interested, start going back to the source. You know, I, I, I'm i going to do this again because I started working on this way back when. With When I was in Italy, I was with Monsignor Balducci of the Vatican. I was with, I also was very close to, to Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut, Heineck, Belay. Zachariah Sitchin, Uri Geller, and they're all in my brand new book, Connecting the Dots. These are only interviews of what people told me. Connecting the Dots new, has, has uh, 40 interviews. Uh, it's being now uh, translated into Japanese and Chinese because it's like an encyclopedia. I can only tell you, Jim, what they told me. I don't know what's going on, but the, the way to find out is to go to an astronaut, to go to a defense minister, to go to a monsignor, to go to uh, like Heineck or, or Valet or those people and get a word for word interview. So the benefit of my work is that I don't write novels. I write uh, a transcription of, the, of, a, of an audio tape. So you're getting from Clifford Stone how he cleaned up uh, or he was part of a crash retrieval team. And you'll get from Clifford Stone in that book that three of the crash retrievals were in Vietnam. So if, if you're trying to piece this together, you go, okay, so they shut down nukes and maelstrom. 
1969, and Robert Salas, you know, is the interview for that because he was there and, and he saw that happen. Uh, and then they're interested in the war in Vietnam. And then what? I mean, they're interested in like every conflict on the planet, thinking that this primitive species is on its way out. And, and then it gets really interesting because it, it's not UFOs and it's not entertainment. Then it becomes philosophy, anthropology, geology, uh, and, and mostly, and mostly uh, you look at the geopolitical, uh, uh, you know, history of the, of the human species, and you realize they've always been here. So I, because I, I am a, an educator, look at it that way. And I think that's much more serious than what's going on with all the media hype. It becomes entertainment and then nobody knows what's really going on. Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's from, from me and from the people that I speak to, um, on my kind of platforms, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of conflict over what they represent, what they are. Um, there's lots of uh, discussions around interdimensional, uh, around extraterrestrial, around time travel, what do you think? And I think I know. I think I've got a rough idea of your 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 answer. But for those um, for those out there listening, what what would you say? What do you think they represent? Well, it's all the above. And the problem. See, I started studying this. Uh, you know, after Paul Hollier died, and after I, I I interviewed everybody, I began studying the history of contact. When I was working with Heineck, I didn't want to know what was inside the ship. I, I couldn't handle that mentally. I was like collecting data. I was like everybody else, don't tell me, I don't want to know. Uh, but then I began studying the history of contact and I realized that in Southern California in the 1950s and 60s, there was actual, actual physical contact. It's on my YouTube channel because I interviewed the guys uh, in the giant rock situation in, in, in Palm Springs and, and, and with the Damsky and and uh, what's a Van Tassel and the Integratron and Howard Menger and all those guys were had contact with human type aliens, you know, that looked like us. And and in in Italy it was Eugenio Sedacusa. In Switzerland it's Billy Meyer. I mean, I started looking at all that. Then in the 1960s, 1963, Betty and Barney Hill were abducted by Greys, and then our whole field ends up with gray aliens. And, and I realized, well, how did that happen? Didn't they know that about the Space Brother movement? Now it's all grace. Uh, and Colonel Corso told me, if you read my book on Colonel Corso, he's got the autopsy in there that the gray is a clone, it's a machine. Uh, and so I began looking at this and then I said, well, if they went away in the 1960s, where they go? And where they went was in the Chilka Desert in Peru, and then the the uh, Latin Americans began to see them, the Space Brothers, with Sisto Paz, Ricardo Gonzalez, um, with uh, Luis Martens. They, they they went where they would have the most impact. In Latin America, they can have a heart connection. So I have spent the last two years in Bolivia. Uh, uh, no, in uh, I'm sorry, in uh, in Chile in Colombia, and I spoke in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in Cordova, Argentina, and, and, and Mexico City, and I've been to the Atacama Desert in Chile and done the, the friendship case there. And so I had to follow where the contact and the messages went. And you asked me about time travel, the ones that are there are time travelers. They have given predictions that have come true. And, and when I was in the Atacama Desert with uh, Ricardo Gonzalez and the ships were over our head, the message was ecological. I mean, Ricardo actually met with these. I could, you could see them actually uh, uh, across the way because it was 200 people in the middle of the desert where there's no flight, uh, uh, you know, of any uh, aircraft. If you want to know the real story, you have to go to Latin America. And we're, then I had to deal with time travel. I had to deal with uh, the idea that we're on two timelines that you could possibly change one. And and Jim, that is really hard for me. I, I to and as far as interdimensional, 
every story I've ever covered has had a paranormal aspect, including the one I just told you about in Lincolnshire or where you are. Um, I just can't, I don't have the bandwidth to go and research that, but that very definitely is interdimensional. And so when people say, are they time travelers, interdimensional, physical, they've been here forever. They also come from other planets. It is all of it. And the reason why it, it is all of it, Colonel Corso personally told me they had uh, categorized 52 different species. And the ones they were worried about the most were the ones that look like us. He said, we know about the clones. He says that, that you know, they're harmless. He says, but the ones that look like us, he said, could be walking in the halls of the Pentagon. You know, and, and of course that's national security. I mean, he's a soldier, that's how they think. You know, that's a national security issue for them. Um, I'm doing a, a master class on Val Thor, <laughs> who was an ET that went to the Pentagon. And the movie The Day the Earth Still Still is, is made about him. And if people want to 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 hear about that, uh, my my website is www.starworksusa.com. I have photographs from the Wendell Stevens archive of him sitting in the in the lawn of Howard Menger in in New Jersey in 1963, sitting right there. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, okay, well, it's it, if they're here, there's a batch of them that are walking around. Uh, and 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 I used to ask Cliff, I said, what are they doing here? And he goes, they're cosmic anthropologists. And I thought, well, that makes sense. What do you think is um what what do you think would be a good place for someone to start if somebody if somebody came into this and they they had an interest in it because of the media and the press and they'd seen some things because it's it's way more in the the, the sort of press the mainstream media shall we say now than it has been before where would where do you think would be a good place for somebody to start to to get into this yeah first of all the the connecting the dots book starts with Heineck and Project Blue Book. So it's got, and it goes right to Zachariah Sitch, and it goes to Yuri Geller, it goes to remote viewing. So uh, it's not because of, there's a book, it's because I did my homework and I'm leaving a history for people. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I did it in person. I don't do anything on the phone. I went to visit these people. I saw Zachariah Sitch. All these photos are my photos. I saw Uri Geller in person. I, I went to Canada to see, I went to South America to see what was going on, I go on my own. I've never been sponsored. So I'd say start with connecting the dots, uh, making sense of the UFO phenomena because it has no conclusion and you can make your own uh, sense of it. But let's start maybe with, the, with what changed the planet and the atomic bomb changed the planet. So the first crash in 1945 in San Antonio New Mexico, the Trinity book uh, with Jacques Vallée writing it because Jacques Vallée is, is, is a legend is one way. But it, what's hard for me to talk about is nobody reads. They'll say, can we see a video on this? And I'll say, you know, if you were in my class and I was teaching you um, the history of the Roman Empire, you, you know, what do you tell me? Can I see a video on it? No, you have to go to the source, read Heineck's books, read Valet's books, read, uh, go, how do you start? <clears throat> I realize that the Space Brother movement, the Giant Rock movement, the Adamski, uh, Van Tassel, Howard Menger, Ophelia Angelucci, all those guys knew in 1950s that this was real. And they were trying to disseminate a anti-nuclear uh, message. So go and study all those guys. I had to do that. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't go to, to like uh, Landers or Giant Rock without reading the books. I wouldn't know what to ask anybody. <coughs> I talked to <coughs> Van Tassel's family. I mean, if I didn't read the book, if I didn't read what he wrote or I didn't do any research, I'd be asking stupid questions. So unfortunately, the only people that are going to find out are your scholars who are going to go back to the 1940s and 50s and, and start following it. And then you're going to find when they go to Latin America, I had the books translated. I had those 
but, uh, Gonzalez's book, Translate Contact from Planet Apu. And that book is incredible. It's Ricardo Gonzalez. And he talks about how the Apunians, who look like us, went to warn uh, the people in Yungai that half the mountain was going to fall and kill 45,000 people. They warned them beforehand. Of course, nobody paid attention. The mountain fell. And I walked over the bodies of 45,000 people. I went to Peru to see that. They had just thrown dirt over the bodies and, and, uh, and, and just level the field. And that was, they got a warning from the, the, the Apunians that live in a base in Huascaran, which is the tallest mountain. The, if, if people just read that, they'll read about what's coming down because those guys are time travelers and they've already been through one timeline. So the name of that book, and here again, it's a book, is Contact from Planet Apu by Ricardo Gonzalez. It's on Amazon. Look, I could jump into a million different subjects with you, and I think you'd probably be one of the best people to talk to on this subject. You're clearly a national treasure. Look, I've I've taken enough of your time. Can I just ask are you what are you working on at the moment? Is there anything that you can talk about or um, that you want to sort of to, to, to discuss? I'm frustrated. I don't know what to tell you I'm working on. I'm working on consciousness raising because it's frustrating for me to see how we started in the 1950s and how we, you know, invented the atomic bomb, then the H bomb, then we would start playing a game of chess with each other. Uh, and I realized that, that that humanity is an amazing species, and I really want it to last. <laughs> I want this experiment to last. Uh, so I I am now going to be speaking in Japan on consciousness because I feel. A lot of what the UFO field is now is too much entertainment. It's just like the latest flavor of ice cream. And now people don't do any any scholarly study. They don't realize we have a history of disclosure. Disclosure is not just Washington, D.C. By the way, the, the, the Chinese airport was shut down. I think it was 1997 because of a UFO. I mean, everybody knew that it was shut down. The UFO was there. O'Hare Airport had an incident with the UFO over it over United uh, C, I think it was C7, Gate C7. People aren't doing their homework. Whatever is out there, and it's all of it, like you said, you know, is it this, 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 it's all of it, has been trying to get through to us that the secret is the evolution of our consciousness, which means to be awake and aware and to go back to a, a consciousness that's more um, you know, uh, inclusive to come together. If we don't come together as a species, we we don't need to worry about the UFOs. We'll destroy ourselves ourselves. I mean, I, when they say UFOs or the <clears throat> or the aliens or the cosmic cultures are evil, I go, why do we need them? We're doing it ourselves. Uh, it, we're really good at at uh, you know hurting ourselves. Why do we need it from outside? Um, so. I what am I working on? I'm trying to attach um, my lectures, and I've got so much data. You know, I just all my stuff just went to Rice University. All the audio tapes, all the stuff, the photos I took, everything is at Rice University because I want it to be there for humanity. But it for me to make a difference, I have to lecture on a kind of collective consciousness where we have to do what's good for everybody and, and be aware that that we have to grow up. We have to go to graduate school. Otherwise we're back in, in, in you know, we're back in the, you know, caveman days. And I think that I've taken the responsibility to do that, to, to lecture on consciousness. So as I have people like Grant Cameron, Dr. Stephen Greer, a lot of people have hit, talk about that anymore we have enough data to know the ufos are real i don't i don't need to to go there i, I mean if you're working with alan heineke's blue book he's an astronomer he knows the difference between venus and a ufo you you're already there you're already there the next question is how can i make a difference well, that seems like a beautiful um, way to end the podcast. So thank you so much for, um, for for talking to me and for your time. I really, really appreciate it. And um, 
hope to speak to you again um, at some point in the future, if that's okay. Sure, anytime. You take care. Yeah, 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 yeah.